Mine. Morning, everyone. My name's Guy. For those of you who we haven't met, my wife Cheryl, we have the great privilege of leading this team, um, the eldership team here. And youth, you guys can go. Enjoy your time in the tent. The youth have outgrown the tent. So uh, again, wonderful problems to have. We don't know what the solution is yet, but we are thinking about it ongoingly. It's awesome to see that. Um, Ferdy and Steph, so nice to have you guys. Ferdy is the, actually the architect. They, um, they're both from 3CR in Pretoria, and uh, he's been the brain box behind all those plans that you see up front there, and popped in to see us to see how we're doing. Thanks so much for all your input here, Ferdy. Um, I feel like the Lord just wants to say to, to some this morning, that he sees you. When I was driving here um, this morning, I, I remember the story of Philip who brought a friend called Nathaniel in the Bible. Do you remember? And he said to Nathaniel, he said, come, we've, we've, we've met the Messiah from Nazareth. And Nathaniel says, Nazareth, what good can come from Nazareth? He was kind of almost skeptical about Jesus. And as Jesus saw him, he said, to you, he said to Nathaniel, I saw you while you were sitting under the fig tree before Philip called you. I saw you. And at that moment, he dropped and he said, you are, basically, he acknowledged that Jesus was the Christ. And I, I just get the sense for both services, first and this one, that some of you have come to church this morning and you've asked for a sign. You know, I, I know it's not always the best thing to do, but, I, but sometimes it does happen where people come and they say, Lord, if you, are, if you truly are God, especially if you're searching and perhaps haven't found that relationship with Jesus yet, if you truly are, then speak to me. Or it's just like God needs to break into a part of your life. And you came this morning saying, Lord, if that's you, then please give me a sign. Well, I think this is the sign. <laughs> like God acknowledging you. In the midst of a meeting, he would acknowledge you and saying, I see you. And Michael, I want to say that to you. Eh? I just feel like God's saying, I see you, boy. I see you in the midst of what's happening. I see you. Yeah. Okay. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the power of the Word of God. And as the Word is brought, may it cut to our hearts. You are Lord of the church, Jesus Christ, the King and the Lord. And in our hearts, we bow our, our program, our desires, our lives before you today. And as you have done so beautifully in worship, Lord, I pray that the, the preach will just be a continuation of that. In Jesus' name, amen. Just before we get into the word, we actually had five child dedications in the first service. Um, babies just seem to be popping out everywhere at the moment, especially at the the first service is, is kind of where they seem to come. Are there any here that have had children in the last year to 18 months? Can you just show us who you are? Okay, it definitely looks like they come to the first service. But I, I don't know how many were here at the back. It was just chaos, absolute chaos. And uh, I, I want to just quickly tell you before I get into the Word, our understanding of baby dedication, because different churches have different philosophies around it or different thoughts. And ours doesn't mean ours is, is better than anyone else's. We just try and be as biblical as we can with our understanding of child dedication. That word dedication is actually not in the Bible, but the principle or the concept of dedication is. And the two stories, there's others, but the two that we use is one in, uh, is in Luke 1 and then um, 1 Samuel chapter 1. Sorry, Luke 2 and 1 Samuel 1. In Luke 2, where Jesus' parents... Uh, take Jesus to the temple, and it uses the word that presented him to the temple. So in those days, there were still Old Testament kind of rituals that they had to adhere by, and when the firstborn was, was, was born, he needed to be presented to the, to the temple. 
That principle of presenting is what we go for. It's like, it's like parents, and in fact, child dedication is more about parents than it is about children. It's parents saying, Lord, you've given us this little one, and we're going to do our best to bring them up in your ways, and so we present this child to you. We dedicate this child to you. You can do with this child what you want. It's actually a very, it's a very special moment. And then the other one is in 1 Samuel, where Hannah's crying out for a child for years and years. And she says, Lord, if you give me a child, I will bring the child to you forever and, and uh, basically hand him over to you. And that's, So they use the word bring or brought there. Um, there are different, there are other different formats that that uh, some churches use, like infant baptism or christening. I'm not saying those things are wrong, but our understanding of infant baptism is a Bible can't repent. Ah, a Bible, a child can't repent. Can it? A Bible also can't. A child can't repent because the Bible says repent and be baptized. So if a child is meant to repent, then it just can't, and that's why. We don't use um, that terminology. And so we did it this morning, four families, five children, and basically watched the parents present their little ones to God. We're having a few more of those um, lined up in the next few weeks or months. You can get word out there for that. I want to get into the preach, and I want to give you a little bit of a, of a background to where we're going this morning. Um, at the end of every preach, every time I preach, obviously you're looking at at uh, up-and-coming preachers, and, I, and I'm asking God from early in the week, Lord, what are you saying? What's next? And so I was doing that this week, asking him what to share this Sunday, and I came across a voice message from Gemma, uh, Mark's wife, Gemma, Gemma Blue, and she sent it to someone else in the church, and I got wind of this, and she spoke actually about repentance, and at the end of her message to this lady, she sang a song. And as I listened to this and I listened to the song, it was like, that's what the Lord wants to say this morning, especially in the light of last week's preach about the frog in the water and watching out for worldliness, etc. And so I'm actually going to tag with Gemma. I'm going to speak for a few minutes, and then she's going to land it by carrying on and then ending with the song that she wrote. So are you ready? You're in for a good morning. If I called it anything it would be called the beauty of repentance. Because repentance is beautiful. Often repentance is linked to sin. We do something wrong and then we repent. So maybe without even realizing it, sometimes our minds equate repentance to something more negative. But repentance is a gift from God. And I wanna just take us through three categories of repentance with scriptures around those and then I'll hand over to Gemma. So if you've got your Bibles, why don't you turn with me to Mark 1, 15. This would be the first category that we'll tackle. It will be on the screen, but I always say it's better to turn to our own Bibles just to familiarize ourselves. It's just better, I think. Mark 1, 15. This is Jesus' grand entrance into his ministry, really. For 30 years, he's kind of been hidden, preparing himself for the last three or three and a half years of his life. And he enters the stage, as it were, with this radical statement in verse 15 of Mark 1, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. He's basically saying, up to now, the old covenant has been in place and it's been necessary to get us to a place where we can be God conscious again. But now, it's like he's saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. God extends his hand to mankind through Jesus and brings him into relationship with him. And then the way that happens is what follows there. Repent and believe in the gospel. And I want to take those two words, especially repent, but it's also important to understand the heart of, behind the word believe. Believe actually comes from the Greek word pisteo. I think that's how you pronounce it. And it simply means to have faith or to entrust yourself and your spiritual well-being to Christ. Believe. The entry into 
relationship with God, or if I just put it very simply, to become a Christian, you've got to do those two things, repent and believe. But believe is important. It's as important as repenting. Believe basically says I've come to the end of myself. I've analyzed enough. I've run away from God enough. I've thought this thing through enough. I've fought with God enough. And even though I don't fully understand everything, I'm coming to a place where I say, I believe. How do you believe? <laughs> it's hard to explain, but the best way I can explain it is when I was a single man, I would ask several couples who are respected in their marriage, and I'd say, how do you know it's the right person? And they'd kind of say the same thing over and over, which annoyed me so much. They would say, you just know. You know that you know. It's like, I don't want to hear that. Everyone tells me that. But when I, I nearly said when I met Cheryl, I actually knew Cheryl for many years before we started dating. One day when the penny dropped, and it's like, wow, she's beautiful, and I think she could be mine. Suddenly, just everything changed, and I knew from that day, I want to marry this lady. And I think repenting, ah, belief is the same thing. It's you've, you've watched, you've analyzed, but there has to come a time where you say, now's the moment. Everything changes from that moment. How do you know when you've done that? How do you know when you're a Christian? You just know. Peter Pollock Years ago, when he would do translocal kind of ministry, he would say this, no change, no Jesus. N-O, no change. If there's no change, then there's no Jesus. And that might, theologically, some guys might pull that apart, but I think there's a measure of truth in that. When Jesus comes in, you change. And it comes through this belief. I believe. I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. You don't have to have all the answers. You just need to believe. I remember a story of a pastor whose son was so called saved or a Christian, gave his heart to Jesus when he was younger, but there was no change. It was just the same. He was the same. And, and, and this pastor was praying and saying, God, there's no change in my boy for years and years. And the child was frustrated and just drifting, drifting. And this pastor went before the Lord and said, what's, what's wrong? And the Lord said to him, he's not saved. He, he hasn't repented, which is the next thing we'll look at now now. And so he sat with his son and he said, boy, do you know what you did a few years ago when you repented and believed and said yes to Jesus? And the, guy, the little guy says, oh, I don't really understand it. And so he led him with scriptural understanding through this and suddenly everything changed. He was born again. This um, very intellectual Pharisee named Nicodemus has a similar kind of wrestling and he goes to Jesus at night because he was ashamed of what his mates would say. So he's kind of secretly searching. And some of you today might be secretly searching. And he goes to Jesus and he says, kind of what must I do, you know, to be saved? And Jesus says, well, you need to be born again. So he says, well, how do you be born again, again. You know, as an adult, you can't go back into your mom, mom's womb. How does this thing work? And Jesus says exactly that. He emphasized born again by the Spirit of God. This is not a natural fleshly thing. This is a spiritual thing. Through faith, through faith. If you are searching, there has to come a time where you've just got to say, now's the time. When I sit on a chair, I don't check the legs of that chair. I just sit. I assume it's going to hold me up. It's the same with Christianity. When I've thought it through and I feel the knocking, now you've got, to make, you've got to take the plunge. That's belief. But even Satan believes. So belief is not enough. That's why Jesus said, grand entrance, repent and believe. Belief is not enough. Belief must come with repentance. And let's look at that word quickly. It's also from the Greek word metanoia which means a few things. It means to have deep sorrow, to think differently, and to change one's mind. You've heard the analogy of being born again. Some people say it's like this. You're walking in this direction, and you have this encounter with God. You repent, and you believe, and you do a 180, and you're now walking in that direction. I think that's a good analogy or metaphor of repenting, but it's more than that. 
the change of lifestyle comes firstly from a heart of deep sorrow. And I think maybe sometimes people battle with salvation because they haven't actually come to grips with the fact that they are sinful and they separated themselves from God because of their sin. And in a sense, their sin drove Jesus to the cross. We should have been on the cross, but our sin pushed him to the cross. And this remorse, God, I'm a sinner. Have mercy on me, I'm a sinner, as we read in the Scriptures. It doesn't mean when you become a Christian, you've got to repent for every single sin. We'd be here all year, some of us. But of late, what I've been doing when I lead people to Jesus, I'll say to them, what are the two or three biggest things that you battle with in terms of your past? The area you think you've messed up the most. Don't tell me them, but think of them. And they think about, I think about it. And I say, now take those three and present them to the Lord. Let Him forgive you of that and everything else as well. It's consciously saying, God, I'm a sinner, and all my sin today is going to be taken on by you. I repent of my sin, and I ask you to set me free. It's a godly sorrow. And then after this godly sorrow, this, this realizing that you need to be saved, there's another thing that's got to follow, and it's this thing of changing the way you think. That's actually what metaneo means, is changing the way you think. A more biblical terminology would be Romans 12 too. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Change the way you think. It's actually, it's not an effort thing. It's a, it's a believing what the Bible says and applying that and choosing to live it out. It's choosing not to think about your past anymore. It's changing the way you think, having a renewed mind, thinking the way he does. So his, your past, you don't have to go there anymore. Because I think differently now. When we sin, it's having a renewed mind. It's repenting and saying, God, that's not who I am. It's not in my nature to sin as a Christian now. And so renewing the mind, dealing with that thing and moving on. That's what repentance actually means. James 5.16 puts it beautifully. It says, if you confess your sins, repent. That's what it means. If you repent or confess your sins, God is faithful and just to forgive you of your sin and to cleanse you from unrighteousness. Repentance brings cleansing, which leads to a life of righteousness. It's so important to understand this because I think there might be people, perhaps even in this church, I, I don't know of any, but there might be people here who actually think that they're Christians, but there's been no change. And maybe you've never understood this. Well, you can rectify that today. It's just, Lord, I acknowledge that I need you as my Savior. I'm a sinner. I'm so sorry. And it'll change. So that's the first point. The others aren't going to be as long. Don't worry. If I had to categorize these three um, points I'm making, it would be in, on, and up. In, which is what we've just read now, this is the entrance into heaven. This gets us in. The second point is the on. And the, the scripture I want to use for that is Matthew 6, 12. It's the Lord's Prayer, which hints at daily, this, it's a daily prayer that the Bible seems to indicate, where it says, give us today our daily bread. It's an ongoing thing. And Jesus makes a statement in teaching us about prayer. He says, in your prayer, say, forgive us of our sins or debts as we forgive those debtors or those that have sinned against us. In order to, we've got in now, now the on, the, the lifestyle, the how to go on in your relationship with God in this, with this concept of repentance. How do we do it? We repent daily. <laughs> on the run. Rather than wait, like Gemma's going to talk to us in a few minutes about David sinning and waiting a long time before he repented. May we not be that person. As soon as we mess up, we have a thought that's wrong or we say something wrong or we do something wrong, it's repenting on the run. God, I'm sorry. There's a horrible theology that used to go around. I haven't heard it for a, few, for a little while now. But at one stage, it was very strong. And it went something like this. We don't need to repent anymore because God's taken away our sins anyway. When I was very young, I used to hear this 
phrase, greasy grace. You know, like grace is cheap. That's kind of what it amounts to. It's God is so good so I can do anything I want to and he'll forgive me. In fact, he's forgiven me already. Greasy grace. It's just there's no, there's no reality to that lifestyle. The Bible doesn't teach that. It says forgive us our sins on a daily basis. You might say, well, God, at the cross, didn't Jesus forgive us all of our sins, past, present, and future? The answer is yes. Because of the blood of Jesus that's covered our sin and covered our hearts and he lives within us, God can now look at us and not destroy us because he sees the blood of his son. So he has forgiven our sins. But actually, this thing has to do with maintaining relationship. If I mess up with Cheryl or I say something that really hurts her, I can't say to her, babe, at the altar, you know, kind of said I do to everything and it's covered now. It's, no, I was a chop. Sorry for being a chop. It's a repentance. It's a, it's a meaning it from the heart. I hope that clears up that theology. If any of you have heard it, just throw it away because it's not biblical. I'm just, I've had this thought actually while I'm speaking now. There's another form of repentance I want to throw into point two here. And that's from 1 John 1, 9. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other that you may be healed. Sometimes repentance, obviously we start with repentance from God, but sometimes repentance actually is helpful to bring someone else into the loop. Confess your sins to each other. If you're really battling to forgive yourself with something, pull a friend along and say, look, the Bible says I need to actually get this thing out. I want it. They can't take the sin away from you, but they can help you. They can pray for you. And then the third and last point. So we've done the in. Repentance gets us into heaven. It gets us on the journey and keeps us on the journey. And now the up. And the up for me talks about this very precious relationship with God that's ongoing, ongoing. And the scripture reference for that I want to use is Matthew 3, 8. Matthew 3, 8. It's very simple. John the Baptist says this. He says, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. So fruit and repentance seem to be linked. What's fruit? Picture a big old fruit tree. Every farmer wants to have a tree that's full of fruit, don't they? That's the goal of every fruit tree is to bear lots of fruit, to sit under the shade of this tree just dropping or drooping. <laughs> is that the right word, drooping? English teacher up the, up the front there, another one over there. Drooping with fruit. Repentance seems to bring this about in our lives. It brings about fruitfulness. And I want to suggest to us that fruitfulness is actually holy. It's a, it's a partaking in the glory of God. It's because when I'm fruitful, it means my relationship with Him has produced fruit. My intimacy with God has produced a life of fruit. Take the, the fruits of the Spirit in Galatians 5. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. And I forget the last one. Those those, um, that's, that's the result of a life of repentance. Those fruits, by, by virtue of the fact that I'm saved, should pop out. And so we're talking about the upside of our relationship with God here. If we want to maintain our relationship and stay close, produce fruit in keeping with repentance, ongoingly, as often as we need to. I just want to say quickly, not repenting is very dangerous. In fact, by not repenting, and I touched on this last week with the frog in the water, by not repenting, what happens is our consciences get seared. And we do something and we don't repent, so we do it again because of the lust of the flesh. It's called worldliness. This worldly heart wants to kind of knock and come in. And we say no, or, or we give in to sin and we don't repent. And we do it a second time and we still feel bad, but not as bad as the first. And then you go into the third, fourth, and fifth. And after the fifth or fourth time or whatever it might be, 
It's like it's not a big thing anymore. And sin should be a big thing. What's happened? The conscience starts to get seared. 1 Timothy 4, 2 says that, whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. To sum it all up, as Jim gets ready, Acts 3.19 sums it up beautifully. It's not on the screen. It says, repent, turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out and that times of refreshing might come from the Lord. Repentance is beautiful. Amen, Jim, won't you come? So Gemma spoke so well first service, but um, at her own admission, she hasn't done this before, so you would never say so. You did so well, but I want to pray for you again. Father, you speaking to us, you're speaking to me about a lifestyle of repentance. And as Gemma comes and shares what you put on her heart, I pray once again, let it come across clearly, let it cut to the heart that we might live humble, clean, holy lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Hello. <laughs> right. Um, I'm going to start with being horribly honest, which is no surprise if you know me, <laughs> oversharer. Um, uh, a few weeks ago, I was, I was feeling quite irritated, and if I'm honest, very ugly in my heart, um, <laughs> towards, I can't even remember who, but someone had said something. They were just annoying, and, um, if I'm truthful. And, um, and I, uh, I didn't respond beautifully. I went to my wonderfully long-suffering husband, Marky, and I ranted, you know, like, oh, why are they like this? And why can't they be more like, you know, it was ugly. Um, and after doing that, um, I kind of actually stopped myself partway through my rant um, and realized I, I felt like a dog chasing its own tail. We have a puppy at the moment who's, bless her, not the brightest, and she chases her own tail a lot, to the point where she actually smacks into our furniture, you know? And you know, Pray for us. But, um, but that's what I was starting to do with my words, and I realized it. Um, anyway, I didn't want this offense to take root in my heart. You know, it was lurking. It was already coming out the mouth. It was dangerous. So I gave myself a time out, which is... <laughs> what I would normally do to my children. Um, and I sat in a room by myself because um, I realized this is toxic. Um, and um, to be honest, I'm more comfortable singing <laughs> than I am speaking. And so I, I just gave God space to maybe sing with me, over me. Uh, I don't want to define it. But he just gave me this specific song. It sort of dropped in my heart, and I found myself singing this over myself. So for, forgive me, I'm going <laughs> to sing at you, a bit weird. Um, but it just kind of went like this. Um, Don't take from me your presence, God, because there's nothing else that I want more. And that was the first line of it, and we'll go there later. But um, I looked up this concept, okay, of like God's presence, and it took me straight to Psalm 51, which um, this idea of please don't take your presence from me, Lord. And when I looked up Psalm 51, it has... I'm an English teacher, so forgive me a nerdy little literature dive. Um, it has this little sort of, I guess what I would call an epigraph or an introduction. And uh, it says, for the director of music, a psalm of David, when the prophet Nathan came to him after David had committed adultery with Bathsheba. Um, and so I was like, ooh, there's context to this psalm. 
This is a psalm of repentance. This is how David responds in worship as a way of repenting to the Lord. So then I was, then I got interested. So I flipped to the story of, of, uh, of David. And, and when I, l- I look at that, um, David really messed up here. He had not only committed adultery, but to try to cover it up, he then, um, in effect, he murdered someone. He murdered this lady's husband, uh, you know, at war, but it was intentional and strategic that he ended that man's life. He had blood on his hands. Um, And David had got away with this. No one had called him out. He was still king of Israel. And until God sent this prophet called Nathan, and Nathan came, and he confronts David about this, these multiple sins, these major issues. David didn't hide. Although there's a long period of time between David being convicted of his sin, and, and you know, by this time he's actually had a child with this lady, he straight away just said, I've sinned against the Lord. And then David does have a huge consequence to this sin. It's public, it's difficult, and I'm not, I'm not gonna go there today just for time's sake. But then in verse 20, after this consequence has happened, and it's, it's, it's very hectic, David went into the house of the Lord and worshipped. David must have known who God was in character. After having committed adultery, after having murdered someone, for his response when called out, to be, I'm going to go into the house of the Lord and worship him. David knows that God is unfailing love. And um, unashamedly, he's running back into God's presence. I think David knew there were only two choices. There's, like me, being offended and ugly and toxic. Or... There's God's presence, because he's holy. And God's presence is beautiful. He's glorious. He's holy. He's perfect. But his presence isn't flaky. It's not that he's fickle like us. You know, I'll be your friend one day and not the next. It's not that. It's that if... If God is holy, his presence, it's not, it can't reside with this ugly trash that I'm trying to carry along with me and stay in. It's rotten. And I, I feel we have these choices. We have, I have the choice to be offended over here and be very ugly and be my religious high horse and, well, they shouldn't have done this. You know, I'm, I'm as ugly as the next person. Or I have the choice to just look at God and be in his presence and dwell in his holiness. And suddenly that doesn't feel so appealing anymore. That's beautiful repentance because my eyes, they're fixed on him. And it's the same with my temper because <laughs> I have one. Um, and, uh, and, and that rage and that ugliness. And I know physically most of us in the room hopefully haven't murdered anyone But figuratively, with my tongue, I definitely have in my anger. I've I've cut some people down. Uh, Or I I can can stay there, or I can can go over here and be like, Jesus, you are beautiful. And that stuff's going to melt away in his presence. It has to. And then I look at adultery, like, you know, David, and I go, oh, well, I haven't actually. Some of us have committed adultery in the room. We have. We've looked at people ways we shouldn't have. But not only that, we've, we've figuratively, forgive the English teacher, we've, we've figuratively committed adultery. We've, we've put stuff above God. Uh, there's addictions. We have them. And I can stay here or I can choose oh, 
this is where I'm going to get wholeness. Looking at you in your presence, God, that stuff's going to melt away. And I feel like these are the... These are the things, and, 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 and if I strive here, I'm like, Lord, I just want to be better. I want to be a better version of me. I'm not what I want to be. I can just be like a dog chasing my own tail for a really, really long time, or I can go, I'm going to be in your presence. Your presence is what is going to reconcile me with you. Eyes fixed on you, your beauty your holiness, because he is a holy God that he wants to be reconciled with us. In this psalm, Psalm 51, it says, he can teach us wisdom in the inmost part, in the inmost place. And we're faced with a really direct choice I can be offended or angry. And this song has stalked me, (laughs) for want of a nicer word, for the last three weeks. Every time I'm trying to go down this road, I just hear, don't take from me your presence, God. Oh, let's go over here. Let's go over here. So if the worship band would love to join. Um, Yeah, I... There's freedom as to how you would like to respond to this. Um, we're gonna we're gonna sing this song that God's laid on our hearts for the church and for us over you. But the words are there, so when you're ready, you can use this as a vehicle too. This can be your guardrail too. Yeah.
come and repent. We can come and say sorry. And, and I'm, I'm reminded of what a simple thing it is to say I'm sorry. And yet, how difficult, how hard, how challenging it can be. But as the band goes through the song again, I just would like to encourage us as a church to say, well, are we going to stay on this side in our offense, in our whatever it might be? Or do we want to step this side and be refreshed and renewed and restored and forgiven? So whilst the band sings the song over you, I just want to encourage you now. Maybe there's a time for repentance in your heart to look at the things that you know you've let the Lord down and come before Him and come and step into His beautiful repentance. another opportunity here. Guys spoke about the in. Repent and believe. And maybe you sat here this morning and you've never fully understood that or presented yourself before the Lord and said, Lord, I want to give my life to you. I want to serve you. Um, now's an opportunity to do that. And so if there is anyone here who for them today is the day, they want to draw a line in the sand, they want to say, Today, Lord, I am coming to you. I'm going to ask you into my life. Could I ask you to be so bold as to put up your hand? If there is anyone like that. We've had a, a small...
special time here this morning. And as we go out into the rest of the week, may we, may we take this with us. May we be so quick to turn, so quick to turn around to the Lord, so ready to be refreshed, to be restored in the beauty of our King. So let's just pray as we, as we end this service today. Father, we want to thank you that you sent your son Jesus Christ to die on the cross for us. We want to thank you that we are not condemned anymore, but we are forgiven and we are set free, free to walk in the truth that you've presented to us today. And we ask, Lord, for all of our hearts that we would be so quick to repent. We ask, Holy Spirit, as we go into the week, that you would be so quick to show us when we're erring, when we're going wrong, when we're stepping down the wrong track. And help us to come back and step into your presence the beauty and the wonder and the peace that your presence gives us. We ask this all in your mighty and holy name.